Hello, my name is Philip Dawson and I'd like to talk with you about a review of these videos and a plan for action. So three take-home messages I'd love it if you've got from watching this set of videos and doing the other thinking and reading and talking that I've recommended. Well, when someone asks you what do you learn in Phil's class, what do you say? I think these are the three, uh, some of the three key things. Firstly, you focus on what the student does. And we go back to Biggs's idea of, um, I guess, a high level of engagement that we would traditionally get from our academic Susan character. But we now know that with the massification of higher education, we don't have as many academic Susans as we have non-academic Roberts. And it's through good course design, through good curriculum and through good constructive alignment that we are able to get these non-academic Roberts to achieve those higher level learning outcomes through tasks that require them to be active, through a focus on not what the student is, because the Robert is never going to be the academic Susan, but a focus on what the student does and what we get them to do to succeed in our courses. The solo taxonomy, to delve a bit deeper, this idea that the tasks and assessment that we get people to engage with matter and the outcomes that we design those tasks to help people learn or evaluate matter. So a unistructural sort of task where someone is required to just identify something, identify a bone on the, the human body is very different from an extended abstract task where someone's required to create something, to engage in the sorts of things we would probably consider as research and that there's a range of tasks in between those two things that we might need to specify outcomes to students very specifically in detail using certain verbs chosen from our solo taxonomy list and that we might need to teach those and that we might need to assess those. So this idea that learning outcomes really matter and the verbs we use to describe learning outcomes matter particularly. Okay, another idea is, well, how do students spend their weeks? And uh, I don't know if this was scary to you, but when I first read it, that they're spending uh, roughly 10 hours per week outside of class working on all of their classes, not just your one class, but across all of their studies, they're spending about a total of 10 hours per week. So we don't have a lot of their time, so we must make really, really good use of that time. And I guess an understanding of the other things that might make up a student's week. Okay, we also talked about how content covered is not the same as content learned. That having, you know, dealt with it on the lecture slides, does not actually mean that you've taught it, does not actually mean a student has learned it. Um, and I know I've had a bunch of discussions with people recently about this idea of should you include something on a slide that you're just going to have to click through because you won't have time, but just so it's there, so you can say that you've covered it. And I guess those discussions turned into the idea of are the slides an aid for your presentation, an aid for learning? Or are the slides a way of communicating what exactly is in the curriculum and you know, therefore what's in the test? Uh, this is a deeper discussion I'd love you to continue. But at its core, we can't pretend that what was on those slides that we just clicked through, we taught or that the students learned. At best, we might be able to say that, well, I think they went and followed it up by doing some reading or something. So to further that, this idea that superfluous but interesting information hurts learning, and I'll not spare you my guitar noodling. Oh yeah, it's lovely, isn't it? The guitar's like slightly out of tune. This idea that less is more, and more can sometimes be less. That having extraneous visuals on a slide, having a whole bunch of different words, having audio that's unnecessary, might actually be superfluous and actually hurt learning. I'm going to stop that now because that's horrendous. Um, but yeah, taking a critical look at PowerPoint slides, but also the outlines of our lessons and identifying stuff that is superfluous, stuff that's unnecessary and getting rid of it. We also talked about that difficult thing of when is an anecdote an example and when is it not? The anecdote being that fascinating, interesting, but 
unnecessary uh, kind of story that you've got, whereas the example helps people understand this core concept you're talking about, helps them apply it, helps them see how it works in industry or uh, in practice. So the anecdote is superfluous, but the example can really be a great teaching tool. So we talked about that. And we had this fantastic quote, which I won't read back to you verbatim, but you'll remember that when I did, we then went and talked about the fact that you should avoid reading long text excerpts from slides. Now I include this here partially because you should avoid reading long text excerpts from slides, but also I guess as a way to expose you to a type of research that gets done in education. So we've talked about a bunch of principles and practices we've been going, and I've tried hard to link those to various sorts of research. And we talked about boosting your setu, and these are some practical things I'd like you to think about this week. I'd like you to use these words in class this week. Actually use the words learning objectives, because if your students are going to evaluate you on how well your teaching helped them meet the course learning outcomes or learning objectives, and you've never used that phrase, they mightn't have connected the dots in their head. Similarly, talk about how your class is intellectually stimulating. How has it really made them think? Because at Monash they're going to be asked to evaluate you on how intellectually stimulating your classes were. Again, about the learning resources, they get asked to talk about those, and the feedback that you give to them. Feedback's an interesting one. Um, sometimes people view feedback as only being written comments on their performance on an essay, and everything else is kind of not feedback. But as we've talked about before, feedback can come from a variety of sources, peers, teachers, uh, automated feedback through like a multiple choice quiz that gives you the answers and feedback. It can be really difficult for students to think about that when they're evaluating you on feedback. So I encourage you to talk a little bit about feedback this week. Talk with your students in a happy way. Show the happiness or fake the happiness, the enthusiasm, the excitement, the extroversion. I am some of those things, but not all of those things, and I'm trying to fake the ones that I'm not. So these are things that we can say in a reasonably evidence-based way will help improve your setu. So if you do them no other week but this week for your students, have a go. And make students feel competent, autonomous, connected. Talk about the gains that they've made in competence since starting the unit. What do they know now that they didn't know before? What can they do now that they couldn't do before? Make them feel competent. Make them feel autonomous. They can take this knowledge and do stuff with it. They are the masters of their learning and they have been throughout your unit. And make them feel connected. Talk about the connections that they have with you. Is there any room for an ongoing connection with you? I certainly am really interested in an ongoing connection with you as my students. If you ever want to talk with me about learning and teaching, or if you've written this article for a higher education journal and you're not quite sure where it should go or you'd like some feedback, I'm really happy to maintain that connection with you and read drafts and have chats about learning and teaching. I love doing that. Are you interested in any sort of ongoing relationship with your students? As they stay students, as they go on and graduate, make them feel connected. Talk about the connections they've made with their peers. We know these are, again, an evidence-based way to improve your setu and show some of your personality or your life. You've heard my cat throughout these lectures, I think. You've seen me be enthusiastic and genuinely interested in this stuff. Maybe do some of that in this final lecture again as a cynical grab for the set you, but also because your students are genuinely interested in who you are. Now let's talk sustainable improvements to learning and teaching. Now I won't go on about this for too long, but I'd just like you to think, do you have a one, three or five year research plan? And similarly, do you have a one, three or five year teaching plan? I'm guessing if you're an amazing career research scholar that you've probably got some sort of a plan for the first one. Um, you could probably even pitch it to someone in an elevator if you had this sort of one minute wait for the elevator, get the elevator, get out. You can probably do the one-year plan then. But can you do that for the teaching plan? 
Have you thought about the teaching plan? Should you think about the teaching plan? I don't have an answer to this. I can tell you that I have the research plan and I can tell you that I have the teaching plan. But if I'm entirely honest, part of the reason why I've got a fairly well-developed teaching plan is because it ties in really well to my research plan as well. And I don't expect that that's necessarily going to be the same for you. But my plans, well, you are the core of my plans. So please keep feedback on any aspect of my teaching coming. I really want to hear it. And reading and writing towards being a scholarly teacher is a core part of my teaching improvement plan. Again, that's how my research and teaching plans are intertwined. And I feel lucky that I have that. And I don't expect that you should necessarily have that or feel bad if you don't. And I guess at a really low level, my plans involve sort of keeping notes to improve my teaching, having a bit of a diary book with me. I'm not a big guy on reflective practice, as you probably guessed from my reflective practice video, but, um, you know, taking just brief notes like that of stuff that's gone on and stuff that I think I would do differently the next time I teach the same unit. That's a really core element of my teaching improvement plans, takes me less than a few minutes each week. So think about what are your plans to improve your teaching over the coming years. <clears throat> and as always, bring it back to learning is what the student does. If you take just one thing from this unit, focus on your students. Focus on what they're doing in your classes, not what you're saying. Not what the textbook says, not on the grades they had before they got here, but focus on what the student does, because that's where the learning actually takes place. Thanks a lot. It's been a real pleasure talking with you through these videos and the many other ways. Bye.